Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Arvind uh, from Devopedia. Today, uh, we are going to be talking about uh, some practical tips for testing web apps. So before I begin the talk a uh, little bit about myself, uh, I, my primary background and experience is in telecom. Uh, I have done a lot of work in uh, 3G, 2G, and other technologies like Wi-Fi, WiMAX. Uh, but uh, uh, along the way, I, I mean, not along the way, even from my student days, I was interested in uh, web technologies. In fact, I would say maybe in the mid 90s, uh, you know, I developed uh, when I was a student of engineering, probably in my second year, I developed the first web page. It was like a personal uh, web page. So those days there was no concept of uh, I mean, the more easiest way to deploy was to take a account on GeoCities and there you could deploy a personal web page. So that's how I got started in the web. And those days, you know, it was only primarily HTML. JavaScript was there, but I didn't learn JavaScript until uh, much later. So I was uh, mainly dealing with the HTML and even the styling back then. People used to do styling inline within the HTML code. So that is how the technology started. Today, things are very different. Uh, we have uh, concepts like back end, front end, full stack, and then single page applications, PWAs. And then of course you have uh, JavaScripts, uh, frameworks like React and Angular, which are very popular. So the landscape uh, for web development has changed quite a lot. I would say change, even though it's like a 30 year span, for the 30 year uh, history, a lot of things have happened. A lot of changes have happened. And uh, frankly, uh, uh, you know, it's hard for people to keep track of all these uh, changes. Anyway, one thing that has come to everyone's realization is that uh, it's not just the development, but it's also the testing that plays an important role. And uh, today's talk is about testing and how do we test uh, web apps and I will share some of the tips that I have gathered from my personal e experience of building and maintaining web apps. So for this session, uh, I will be specifically covering nine tips. So I'll just lay it out here for you briefly. So the first tip will be purpose of testing. Then we'll look at test configuration, what it's about modular test cases. Uh, so we all know that modularity is important uh, in design, but it's also important in testing. Then we look at uh, techniques like bypassing the GUI, dependency injection and mocking, why it is useful uh, for a testing environment. Then number six will be CRUD versus data first approach. So many of our applications are very much data driven. driven. They are not static. A lot of data is there in databases. So the application picks up the data and renders it to the users. So the point six is very much database focused. Next, we'll look at some things which are essential for many sites. For example, CAPTCHA, when there is a user login or any kind of a sensitive form, you present the user with a CAPTCHA. How do you automate that for testing? Then we'll look at things like managing tokens, API keys, etc. In general, any kind of secret that you deal with in your application, how do we manage that in a testing environment? Finally, uh, looking under the hood. So as testers, we may treat the application as a black box, but then there is much more we can do when we look under the hood, see what's inside the application and what kind of insight that and gives us towards better writing better test cases. So this would be the overview. These are the nine tips that we will cover. And uh, although this is uh, technical, we will uh, the talk is very much uh, at a high level. So even though you are new to testing or a new developer, you should be in a position to follow it. I hope that sounds good. So let's get started. Uh, because in today's talk, we'll be using Devopedia as a case study. Uh, so it's uh, useful to look at the Devopedia code base. And this slide gives, you, gives us a summary of what the code base contains. In fact, this chart is not something I created. If your uh, code repository is in GitHub, GitHub automatically prepares this chart for you. 
So here, if you navigate to your uh, home page of the repo, you will find this chart. So a few things uh, to notice here. Uh, all of us are familiar. Uh, I hope you are familiar with the MVC model, model uh, view controller. So typically a web app is designed in this kind of an architecture. It's a common architecture. There are variants of this, but typically this is the one MVC. So the view, the view part is here. So in our case, the view part is implemented as Twig, which is a templating system that we use. So that accounts for about 11% of the code base. So I believe GitHub generates this chart just by looking at the number of lines of code. So they use a uh, LOC as the measure. So 10% of it is uh, templating. Uh, uh, then of course, templating alone uh, is not part of the view. The CSS and less files are also part of the view. So these take up uh, you know, another 11%, 2.5%. So that composes the view. The model and the controller, they are in PHP. So Devopedia is really a PHP application and that is 25%. Of course, the dynamic components are in JavaScript, so that is about 8.6%. So what is the Python part? Python part is uh, the test cases. So all the automation that we have done for testing, they are implemented in Python. So if you look at this immediately, uh, we get an uh, insight that the code base for testing is larger than the code base for development. If you look at purely on the comparing Python and the PHP code, you know, uh, the testing is has a larger code base compared to the development. Even if you combine this with, for example, the templating, still it comes to only 35%, 36%. So this underscores the importance of testing. And we can argue or we can debate uh, why is it that test cases are taking more lines of code compared to the actual uh, uh, dev code. There are reasons for that, but we'll not get into it. That is a separate talk by itself, but I just wanted to show you this slide. To uh, share that testing is quite an important activity and it may take more time than the development itself. Since we are going to use Devopedia as a case study, uh, it's uh, useful to look at the architecture. Very simple architecture. We have a GUI layer through which uh, visitors or logged in users interact. Then third party apps uh, or our own apps uh, which are deployed elsewhere on the cloud, they may interact with the app through an API layer. So the app itself uh, served by the app server slash web server. So the app that we use, it's based on a PHP framework called Slim. Along with Slim, we use a lot of third party packages, so it makes sense to do this. Why duplicate effort when there are so many open source packages out there that we can use within our app? So obviously we are not the only ones doing this. I'm sure uh, all developers will be doing this. It drastically cuts down the development time. Then we have a database. Uh, so all the data that we have are sa saved in MySQL. Then application specific code. So we have middleware, we have controllers, we have the views, uh, and then some common libraries which are used by uh, middleware and controllers. So this is the overall view of the app. Uh, if you have not seen, uh, maybe it will be good to look at uh, the Devopedia site if you have not seen it already. So this is the home page and uh, there is a page called Browse Articles where you can browse all the latest uh, articles uh, that are online. And if you log in, you can also see articles which are not published. So this, for example, is not yet a published article. It says here unpublished, whereas these are already published articles. So this is a simple page and then you can. So the page is paginated, so you can go to the next page and so on. You have a menu on top. You have a footer menu as well. And then some social icons, icons at the bottom. We have a search facility here. Then we have login, logout, and then managing your account profile, editing your profile, and so on. 
Then we have a page here where you can explore the articles using a graph like structure. So this is also to be tested, right? So testing is not just uh, testing uh, things like this, which are somewhat easier, but also testing more complex things like testing the graph, testing the connections between nodes. So this, these things should also testing. Should, so when the page loads, you know, this is not populated, but when the user clicks, you know, the content here changes. So these are dynamic behavior which are implemented in JavaScript. So our test cases should also be testing these kind of dynamic behavior. And if you look at any particular example, uh, particular article, so this is how a typical article on Devopedia looks like. It has a summary. It has a discussion section. It has a menu structure on the left, so users can click on it. And again, here there is some dynamic interaction, so you can go to the next tab and so on. And more dynamic interaction here. If you look at this menu, an overlay comes, right? And then you can share this page to your social channels. You can look at the chat. You can participate in the chat if you are logged in. You can like a particular page and so on. If you are logged in, then you can also edit the article. So you can bring up the edit thing. So these are the main things that need to be tested as part of uh, our test uh, effort. And there are many more pages uh, which. Uh, as an example, I'll show you the public profile page of a typical user. So this is the contributions of a particular user. So this again has to be tested, right? So this is. Uh, what the app is all about. Now let's be, uh, let's focus on the testing part. So what do we do at Devopedia for testing? How, uh, what, what, what are some facts? We use Python Selenium for test automation. We use PyTest as the test framework. OASP Zap for security testing, GitHub Actions for CICD. We have roughly 450 GUI tests and about 150 CLI tests. OK. So let's start with the first tip. What is the purpose of testing? Is it to find bugs or is it to validate the product? So here I'll give a pause. Maybe if someone has a question or if you have a comment, you can bring it up now. OK, if not, let's move on. So now uh, if you, uh, uh, what is the purpose of testing? Is it to find bugs or to validate a product? In fact, if you ask testers, they will say it is to find bugs. But if you take a developer's perspective, developer of course is very optimistic. He is of the view that you know the product is uh, working well. There are no significant bugs. So the developer's perspective is uh, we are here to validate the product. But the truth is that uh, uh, the purpose of testing is somewhere in between and it is beyond these two things. So a very uh, useful quote for us to remember is quality is the product of a conflict between programmers and testers. So two important words here, one is quality and one is conflict. So we know from our own experience that you know, there is uh, testers and developers usually do not agree. It's like uh, developers build the code, get it ready and give it, hand it off to the testers, thinking that their job is done. And then testers, when, uh, when they raise bugs, developers complain. So it is a conflict, but the outcome of this conflict is really a quality of the product. So testing is beyond finding bugs or beyond validating the product. It is really to improve the quality of the product, and it could also be quality of the process for that matter. So. Uh, uh, this is really the perspective of a product manager or a business perspective. So uh, at the business level, these are minor details, finding bugs, validating the product. Finally, what they want is to have a higher quality product with which customers can be happy. So it is important for us to realize this because then both testers and developers can come to the table 
discuss and uh, you know agree on many things if they have the right attitude towards testing. So it is not just finding bugs or validating the product, although these are important, but then these lead to a better quality of the product. Number two, test configuration. So this is uh, very well known, but then if you are new to testing, there may be a tendency to hard code a lot of things in your test cases or for, the, for that matter in your test environment. So do, do not hard code because you will be testing multiple scenarios, maybe even in multiple uh, different uh, environments. You may be testing on your developer machine. Tomorrow you may test, be testing in the cloud. Let's say you are doing a CI CD pipeline. There certain th uh, things will be different. Then you move to staging or uh, yeah, when you do some testing on staging again, there will be certain things about the test environment, test configurations, which will be different. So you don't want to be hard coding stuff in your uh, test cases. So the useful thing which I have found is have a test configuration file and you can have it as a YAML file. I have shown it here as a JSON file. So what kind of things usually go into a test configuration file? For example, executable paths, log paths, database access, test data source, database offsets, browser options. So these are some of the things which can vary from one environment to another. So to give you an example, on a developer mission, you know the log PHP error log may be stored here. But then when you're doing your testing on staging, the error log may not be here. It may be in a very different uh, path. So that you can easily control it by changing the test configuration. Same thing for the PHP uh, EXV as well. In uh, CI CD pipeline, it may be actually called PHP 8.1. But on a Windows machine, you may have to give the full path. Let's say your dev environment is a Windows machine, you give the full path. Another useful configuration, maybe sometimes when you are doing testing, you don't have connectivity to the internet or you purposely want to do testing without connection to the internet. Then you set this flag to false. So your test case uh, uh, will be configured. All your test uh, cases will be configured to run the test case in an offline environment. Right. Likewise, configuration uh, connection access to the database. Definitely, this is going to change. In your dev machine, you will have probably root and no password. But on a product, uh, on a staging machine, definitely you are not going to give an open configuration like this you will have a more complex password and a user uh, login account. So these are the things which can be configured, uh, you know, in a test configuration file, which I have always found to be useful. So as I mentioned, you know, when you are moving your test environment from local to CI CD or staging, these things come into play. OK, just as we have more uh, modularity in uh, writing application code, test cases can also be modular. So I showed you just now uh, a snippet of what an article looks like and how you can edit an article. Now, how would you test it? We can put all of this in a single test case. But a better option would be login is a separate test. Loading the article form is a separate test. Saving the article is a separate test. So it is. Uh, uh, yeah. So this is what we mean by modular test cases. So log, uh, So what we can do? Login is a separate test case, and by doing this, what what happens? It can be executed alone, standalone. That means we execute only this test case, and then do, as part of this test case, we may validate four or five different things. So that is uh, the nature of the test case. But then this login test case can also be part of a longer sequence. So this can be chained to other test cases and in con in consolidation, they tested a completely different scenario. You log in, load a form and then save the article. So when a login test case is part of a bigger chain, you should be able to configure this test case in such a way that validation can be skipped. Why, why am I saying this? Because you have a separate test case which you are in which you are going to validate all the things. 
So when it is changed at chained as part of another test case, you can validate again, but it is not necessary. So the point is that you should write your test case in such a way you should be able to skip when used in a non standalone mode. So this is to give ourselves flexibility on how a particular test case can be used at runtime. So bottom line is these three can be used as standalone test cases or they can be chained uh, to form a longer uh, test sequence. An alternative is to implement these as a library of functions. So that's also possible, but you know, I won't say it's a bad choice, but in the interest of modularity, this may be a better option. So just continuing from the previous slide, uh, some terminology, the smallest unit of test execution is called a test case. So in this case, you know, we looked at login as an example. So that is a test case. But then when you have a sequence of test cases, test cases executed in a specific sequence, that is called a test procedure. So this is uh, common terminology. I don't know how many people uh, still actively use, in, use this terminology in the industry. Then you have something called a test plan. So when you sit, let's say you have a piece of software which is ready for testing, you may not necessarily test all the test cases when, when as a tester, when you receive a particular build. You may decide, okay, I'm right now I'm going to test only this particular uh, set of features. So that would be called a test plan. What test cases and procedures that you need to execute at a particular time? So that is a test plan. Some people may also call it test strategy. And this is well known for better reuse of test cases. Each test case shouldn't do too many things. Some people may also say each test case should do something very specific. So that's generally the case for better uh, modularity and uh, reuse. Finally, in Devopedia, as I noted earlier, we have two layers, CLI layer and GUI layer, and of course, API layer is there. Uh, so these kind of test cases should be clearly separated. Uh, again, in the interest of uh, modularity, basically these are two separate layers, so there is no need to complicate things uh, by putting them in the same test case. And then, of course, when you are interfacing to DB, separate that from the main test execution. So this is, uh, I mean, if your test code is designed properly, obviously this will be a separate class or a separate, separate set of files, however way you want to do it. The next tip is bypassing the graphical user interface. Now, uh, why, why am I saying this? So uh, imagine, uh, let's go back to our application. So let's say, you know, uh, I am a user, I want to edit my profile. So a login form comes up and now, uh, I mean, the edit profile page comes up and here I can edit. So now it is obvious that when people, before you, uh, you save this into the database, you need to do validation, whether user inputs are given properly. Now there is something called client side validation where you validate everything on the browser using JavaScript. So now the question is, is that enough? So some people may think, I mean, inexperienced uh, uh, testers uh, may think that is enough because how else is uh, someone going to edit the user profile? They are going to edit through the GUI. So they may think that uh, you know this is the right way to do it, uh, client side validation. So let me test for client side validation. But imagine a case where you bypass the, suppose you are a hacker and hacker gets hold of the cookies used in this browser that are, that are currently active in the browser. Uh, that is to say somewhere else, you know, there is a security hole. So somehow the hacker got hold of the cookies of this particular user. Now the hacker using the cookies, he can bypass the GUI. He can, that means to say he can bypass the validation and directly give a request to the server. So he can give a post request with invalid parameters just to crash the system, denial of service, or even MySQL injection. So all kinds of attacks are possible once you know uh, something is compromised somewhere else. So now 
by doing this, the hacker has completely bypassed the client side validation. So even though you have client side validation in place, which are you know active in the browser, by bypassing the browser, the uh, hacker can create havoc in the system. Which is why even though you have client side validation, it is important for developers to implement server side validation. Because of this issue. And as a tester, you should we should not rely only on the GUI for validation. We should also uh, test for the client uh, server side validation. So how do, can we do this? So the screenshot that you see here, this is the screenshot of an app called Postman, which is typically used for API testing, but it can also be used for you know any kind of web app testing. Because ultimately, what the web app uh, client does, uh, it is going to send a request to the server. So that behavior can be that request can be mimicked exactly in uh, Postman. So, so using Postman or other tools like curl, if you don't like a tool like Postman, which is again a graphical interface, you want to do it uh, through command line, which is actually what we do. Because uh, because in a test environment. We don't want to uh, unnecessarily uh, use a GUI. Curl is uh, good enough, so we can use Curl to bypass the GUI and exercise the server side validation of your app. So this is important for testing for testers, but at the same time, don't forget your client side validation as well. So uh, as a side note, I want to mention that. Dependency injection. So this if you have uh, done any kind of unit testing unit testing is typically uh, ha has uh, its own challenges because if the system is not properly designed tightly let's say one module of the code is tightly coupled to another module say module a and module module b are tightly coupled it's hard for you uh, to test module a without bringing in module b so we are talking about unit testing here so this coupling uh, is actually bad from a, basically it tells you that uh, the uh, system is not properly uh, designed anyway as a tester we are required to as i mean as a developer or tester we are to, uh, required to do a little bit of uh, some uh, unit testing so here i'm giving an example let's say we have a notify function again this is python code and it does some processing on the content maybe it looks at the attachments so all kinds of things it does and finally it sends an email so the notification that is being sent is sending out an email okay so let's assume the function is doing this now the problem is in a test environment i may not have a mail server running so the send email will actually fail i will not be able to send out an email but the problem is this is hard coded in the code so how do I overcome this? So this is where something known as dependency injection is used by developers. So why do they use it? It is not for their benefit. They use it because it makes the code more testable from a unit testing perspective. So a simple way to explain dependency injection using this example is you give an extra parameter to this function called provider which is a uh, which is obviously configurable uh, before you start your testing and then because functions can also be passed as parameters in most modern languages this provider is actually a function and then this provider is callable because it's a function and it is called exactly like in this case the only difference is here it is hard coded as send email here you are giving it as a uh, argument as part of the function signature now what happens in a test environment Normally in production, you would provider will be set to send email. But in a test environment where you don't have an email server to send out emails, you can replace this. The parameter you will be passing, you can say write to file or write to a TCP IP socket. This is done purely for a testing purpose. So this gives us a lot of flexibility for unit testing. Even though we don't have a mail server, now we can still call notify. There is no problem because now the actual function that will be called is now configurable configurable and this configurable uh, this configuration can again come from your test configuration 
right? But it can come from other means also. Let's say from an environment variable or etc. So this is the kind of thing that can happen. Now uh, I have explained, tried to explain dependency injection in a very simple, uh, simplified manner. But uh, this concept of dependency injection is very popular in Java. And if you look at some of the Java code, you will get very confused because Java is already a very verbose language compared to Python. But dependency injection uh, is, uh, if you look at the kind of code that this brings in, it makes the whole code even more complex. There is a lot of scaffolding and uh, not only that, uh, uh, lot of people use uh, frameworks for implementing dependency injection. And those frameworks uh, unnecessarily complicate the, complicate the syntax and code maintenance. So the point I want to make is, I mean, this is not something that affects developers because it's uh, affects testers because it's developers who select how to implement dependency injection. But if you are a developer, yeah, try to keep your codes simple. Don't use a framework for dependency injection because it makes the code very hard to read. And frankly, in my opinion, uh, very hard to maintain as well. Mocking. So the next uh, thing which is very much related to dependency injection is mocking. So take an example of an app which uses a external API. So in this example, we are talking about a weather API. So let's say there's an external weather service. You want a particular, uh, say current weather and tomorrow's weather at a particular lat latitude and longitude. Now let's assume for argument's sake that this is a paid API. So you for just for testing, because you may be calling this API during your testing uh, lots of times. And you don't want to unnecessarily uh, increase your uh, bill, monthly bill. So and so that is one reason. Another reason is, you know, in many cases, you, know, you don't want this dependency while testing. It's OK in production, no doubt. But during testing, you don't want to depend on the weather API. So what you do, you create uh, something known as a weather mock, which behaves almost exactly like the weather service at the interface. That means it will ex accept the same uh, APIs that the service accepts and it will give similar responses. The responses may be random. It won't be the actual weather, but uh, semantically and syntactically it will be correct. So now you can uh, do something like this uh, for your test environment. So mocking again is a very important concept. So as testers, we need to learn this properly so that we can better unit test our applications. So at this point, I'll give a pause. Any questions people can ask? OK, then we move on. Everything you covered so far is only with respect to unit testing, right? Nothing else. No, no nothing like nothing that. To do with uh, system testing integration. See, mocking and uh, dependency injection, they are very particular to unit testing, yes. But other things uh, like bypassing okay. the GUI, these are all you can consider system testing. Because uh, okay. you are exercising the entire application through the web browser. You are not isolating it to a particular okay. application, a particular module okay. or uh, stuff like that. Yeah. OK, so that differentiation also is there. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Now uh, all of you may be familiar with CRUD. That is to say, if your application is using any kind of data stored in a database, this concept of CRUD uh, uh, well, people have uh, coined this term CRUD, but it expands to create, read, update, delete. These are the four ma major categories of operation that people perform on a database uh, table or a row. So create, creating a new record, let's say. Read, reading records from a particular table or tables. Update, updating a record. So a record is already there. You are modifying certain columns uh, of the record, so that would be update and then deleting a record. Crud. So how do you test uh, when you have a database in your app? So people, I don't know what is the common uh, way in which people do. Uh, maybe somewhere someone has published a study 
but my uh, guess is that people follow this approach they create something they read that means they do it in this order so let's say uh, creating an account create a user account so they go to the gui you have a login uh, field and then uh, username field and then the password field they fill this up then they check in the database whether it is properly filled up then they try to read that from the database so they try to do this by trying to log in to the app so obviously when you are logging into the app you will be reading under the hood you will be reading data from the database and let's assume the user changes the password so that would be considered as an update operation and then finally let's assume assume that the user de decides to move out of the system he uh, wants to delete the account so that would be a delete operation so this is the kind uh, uh, this is the logical sequence in which you know developers may develop the apps and even testers may test but is this the right approach so uh, in my experience uh, i have been testing or developing apps in a completely different approach and i will share my approach i don't claim that it is the right one but it has worked uh, well for me and i'll explain the reasons the approach i take is data first approach where i have a separate script which generates test data and i inject this directly into the database by doing this i completely bypass create and update so already the application starts with a lot of data in the database because i have injected all the data using a separate script so i have a bunch of uh, tables uh, and in each table i may in inject uh, 100 rows uh, records and so on now by doing this what do i gain i can straight away go towards testing read even for developers you know i can focus on developing my app for the read operation because this is far easier to design and develop and uh, by injecting a lot of data there are a lot of things i can test for example i can test pagination when i have lot of records hundreds of records obviously i am not going to display everything to the user as we saw in the uh, in the beginning browse articles we show only let's say 30 articles so we can test pagination we can test fil filtering we can test searching sorting we can test the app for performance so all these things all these things can be tested right out of the bat because we are focusing only on read and all the data is already in place in the system and after that you can do delete which is again a very simple uh, operation then we can focus on creating the actual html forms to inject data into the system so again we are talking about system level testing but when it comes to unit testing you can again uh, do things differently because uh, there when you want to create something you can inject by uh, using per, uh, what do you call postman or curl so you can use those kind of tools as well but this kind of a data first approach has worked well for me and this is what i'm sharing so let's go back to our app uh, now instead of showing you the live app i will show you the test app just to give you an in, uh, insight what the what kind of data there are in the test app so you can see here this is an article which we did not create uh, create during using the create function this was created by the test generator test data generator so just arbitrary data random words this is all created by the test data data generator just for testing the read operations so all our test cases are based on this and then it's only when we want to test you know write operations like editing the page then we need to focus on those kind of testing so this is the approach uh, that i have been adopting for some time and this also plays nicely with uh, tdd because you have already uh, all the data in your databases you can quickly create the test cases even though the application itself is not ready next up uh, tool tip uh, i mean tip number 7 is captcha so you can see here uh, 
you know, uh, this is a, re a registration form on Devopedia and uh, a captcha is presented to the user. Now the user has to prove that I am not a robot. Now, how do you automate this in testing? You can't. Frankly, you, you can't. The reason is this captcha is very well designed. And uh, it is obviously a recaptcha. It is coming from Google. And no matter how uh, smart you get in your uh, testing, you cannot bypass this. You cannot automate this. Because uh, if you try to try to look for this particular element and then you try to use your Selenium web driver to click it, that click will not actually work. And uh, the captcha actually gets more complex. Sometimes you are presented with a list of images and it will say click all images which have a traffic light. Click all images that have a that have hills or a fire hydrant. So those kind of uh, challenges are also presented to the user. So in a test automation environment, how do you bypass this? That is the question. Now you can't bypass recaptcha like this, but the alternative is you can use an in-house generated captcha. That means in your application, don't use third party captchas which are difficult to test. You create your own captcha on which you have control and because you have control, you can bypass it during testing. So that is one option, but obviously that is not a preferred option because you have the extra or developers now have the extra job of creating an in-house captcha. The whole point of using recaptcha is, uh, you know, you are using code created by someone else. Without much effort, you are getting that feature. Now, so if you want to use a third party captcha solution like this, you better select something that is testable. Fortunately for us, this recaptcha, which is coming from Google, is testable. And it is very easy. And you can look at this link here. I'll open it up. So this is the documentation from Google for recaptcha. And uh, here it says clearly, I would like to run automated tests with recaptcha. What should I do? So in this particular case, they have specific uh, API keys and secret keys. And by using these specific keys, you can bypass, bypass recaptcha during testing. So this is a very uh, useful thing. If you are using another version of reCAPTCHA like V3, then you use a separate uh, set of keys for the testing environment. If you use V2, uh, it is even simpler. You can use these two specific keys. So this is how you can bypass reCAPTCHA. So this is I, so I am just showing this as an example of how testing can be done for these kind of things. Now CAPTCHA is just one part of the problem for testers. Nowadays, uh, when you log into systems uh, or uh, for into web apps, uh, very often you don't uh, have just user login and password. You have something called uh, multi-factor authentication. You may have uh, SMS, you may have a specific code coming to your email, or in some cases uh, you may have an Android phone on which there is an authenticator app that is installed or you Google, when you try to log into your Gmail, uh, Google may ask you, okay, now go to your Android phone and click that specific message to aut authenticate this login. So authentication has become much more complex, which is good from, you know, from a security standpoint, but it is a nightmare for testers to test that. So CAPTCHA is just one part of the, like a tip of the iceberg. But uh, you know, if you want to automate the testing where multi-factor authentication is involved, testing becomes much more complex. But that is not something which we can cover today. That probably we can take it up in a separate talk. Now coming to tip number eight, uh, managing to uh, tokens, API keys, and passwords. In general, managing any secrets. So these are well known. Uh, I'm just putting it out here so that people don't forget it. First thing, don't commit these into code repos. So if, for example, these are saved in some kind of a JSON file and they are part of your uh, uh, like working directory, 
you better make sure that they are included in your git ignore so that by mistake you don't commit them into your repository so that is the first thing the next uh, uh, gatekeeper you can have is uh, use a git hook uh, to catch unintentional commits so git hook uh, is another uh, i mean we we had a session on git hook a few uh, like uh, i think couple of months back so before you can commit this can do some checks on what you are committing and whether that commit is uh, going to be valid according to the rules of the commits uh, according to rules of the hook script so in in a custom hook script you can actually check that you are not committing any kind of tokens api keys or passwords so that is another uh, barrier that you can create to avoid this kind of mistake so how do you actually read uh, secrets in the production uh, or even the test environment you should read them only from untracked files not committed files or better still they can be part of environmental environment variables right so here i have given an example what kind of things can go into let's say a json file which is not tracked there is some disturbance i request you to mute your microphone so you have like facebook login credential zap api key if you are using oauth uh, then those kind of keys and secrets so these may be necessary for your app and if so you should not uh, commit them and you should manage these secrets this way so when you are not tracking how are you committing we are not committing we so are not, not committing these files are going to remain in your local system how will the deployed version of the app will use this yeah so that is should be part of the deployment you have to create that separately during deployment so you are deploy uh, so automation of deployment is something else so as part of that yeah. you have to do it so dot env also is not allowed you can but uh, see in uh, you can but environmental vari environment variables is what is typically rec recommended but how okay. do you create this environment variables you have to create it from a certain script when the Not environment script, comes right out. if it is one or two variables i do it if i have 10 15 variables i'll have to do it uh, uh, it's a laborious process right yeah that is where you have the tools like terraform and other deployment tools Okay. And to build Terraform, so through those tools you have to create those variables. Okay, 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 got it. Thanks. So tip number nine is looking under the hood. So as testers, we may look at the application as a black box. So you don't know what's going on inside. What is the code inside? That's fine. You give a set of inputs and you expect a set of outputs. So that is what. we mean by black box testing but is that enough so usually not uh, it is very good for testers to look what is inside that black box try to understand what is going on under the hood and that will enable them to create better test cases they will understand the system better so let's uh, look at a few scenarios so testing is not just looking at the input and the output so let's say i gave a set of inputs and i got the outputs does this mean that my test case is passed typically yes but then there is much more that you can do within the same test case what you can do is once the test case ends you can analyze the server logs you can analyze the browser console logs and look for any warnings or errors that might have come up now it may be a fault in the way your test system is designed or your test case is designed but so your test case might have passed because it is looking only at the expected inputs expected outputs but then if you go and look at the logs you may find something fishy so a tip the useful tip here is build these things into your test case so that at the end of the test case you check these as well and if you notice something funny let's say a warning or worse still an error has come up in these logs you forcibly fail the test case so that way it will come come up uh, for notice immediately perform html validation so this is very easy to understand 
So if you go to W3C, they have something known as a HTML validator. So let's say I have designed this web page. I am serving this web page to the clients. How do I know that this web page, that the content that I have served is uh, uh, valid from a HTML perspective? So what do I mean valid? Suppose uh, let's say there is a table somewhere and the ending tag of the table is missing or ending tag of a div or a span is missing somewhere. You know, those kind of errors are what I'm talking about. So some of those errors, it may show up visibly in a very obvious way, so you can catch it very easily. But then there are many other ways in which the HTML validation can fail. And you will not notice anything on the graphical interface. On your browser, you will not notice that something is failing. So in those cases, this is what I mean by looking under the hood. In those cases, we should use a service like this. You know, this is given by W3C, so you can validate by direct input, by file upload or by URI. This is all manual methods, but uh, if you are doing automated testing, they have an API as well. So use that API and call this and uh, it will tell you whether your HTML is valid. So this is another way to enhance your testing. The next thing is study or review development code. So uh, I'll give an example of this in the next slide, but testers are also uh, should also look at uh, the code written by developers uh, as part of the application. They can either do this as a study activity or as a review activity. So what do I mean? So uh, when code reviews happen in any project team, it's not just developers who should participate in those code reviews. It's important that testers also get actively involved in code reviews, code walkthroughs, so that they understand clearly what is happening in the system, how the code is uh, implemented. Now, the, uh, why this is so? Because they may gain some insights and they may be able to design more intelligent tests if they understand the inner workings of the code a little better. Detect SEO problems. So like we did for perform HTML validation, you can also detect problems of SEO. Uh, so you can do that uh, in. Uh, so Google has a service called Google. Console search or something like that. And uh, Bing also has something. So let me see. Uh, yeah, Google search console. So this can show you some problems related to SEO. So it can tell you, for example, how is the page experience? Uh, how are the core vitals? So for example, if the page is loading too slow, it will tell you here. Or is, if there is any mobile usability issues, that means the fonts are too small or two links are too close to you, each other. That uh, So on a mobile, they may not be easily clickable. So those kind of issues will be brought out by Google Search Console, and this has an impact on SEO. So this is another way. So this is going beyond the normal testing, but it is important for the test team to capture these kind of things, things as well. So now, as I promised, uh, let's take a look, uh, take an example, study or review dev code. So take a look at this example. So based on Devopedia, I have created this example. Let's assume that there is a function edit article and it takes in a bunch of parameters. So first thing the function does is it validates the parameters. So this is server side validation. If there are any other errors, it returns immediately. If there are no errors, it proceeds and then it prepares the article. After the article is prepared, it is uh, trying to update into the database. If update is successful, it does some post processing and then returns zero errors. If update is not successful, it returns an error message. So very simple, straightforward code. But then uh, if you look at it critically, there are some things that are not very well understood in this code. Firstly, we notice that it's a public function edit article. So this indicates and then there is a this pointer used 
this indicates that this is a method of a class. So that is the first thing we notice. And this is a public function. And then in public function, so many parameters are called. Now all these parameters are passed to validate function to validate the input. That's fine. Nothing wrong here. But I will ask the question. Why are the same parameters now getting passed to prepare article? We have already passed it once to another method of the same class. So presumably we can guess as a reviewer. We can guess. OK, maybe this guy is only validating it. He is not changing the state of the object. So that is an assumption or a guesswork that we are doing. Or we can say, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, so that 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 is the one thing we can say. So we can assume that validation is not changing the state of the object. So that is the reason when we call prepare article again, we are calling the same set of. Uh, calling the same set of uh, arguments, but then something strange happens here. Here the last parameter is not there. So what does it mean? Does it mean that uh, so this kind of gives us a clue that validation is doing more than validation. It is actually changing the state of the. Uh, what do you call object probably because this parameter is now no longer getting passed to prepare article. So it looks a little strange. There is a disconnect here. Second thing we have to ask is. So why both of these have similar parameters getting passed? So what is the access of this? Is it a private or a public method? Is this a private or a public method? So these kind of questions you have to ask as a reviewer and then go deeper into the subject. So I will tell you what kind of kind of bug can occur in this case. The bug that can occur is validation actually changes the state of the object. So for example, let's say uh, this version is incremented inside this function and stored as a uh, attribute of the object. Then when you call prepare object, now there is a disconnect. This version is sent again. Plus there is another version which has already been incremented, which is part of the object. So now this function is or method is going to is is able to access two values which are uh, not consistent. And if this is, I mean, if this kind of scenario can occur, then the tester has to say, OK, this is the way I look at it. I'm going to test for it. That is what the tester will say. So this is what I mean by looking into the code as a tester. What test cases can you think of? Does the code suggest any design problems? So these are the nine tips that I wanted to share. I hope you have found this session useful. Uh, if you have any questions, we can take those questions now. So okay, now that no. your selenium is used, right? Yeah, we yes. are using selenium, uh, but selenium itself, uh, you can uh, use it via Java or other languages. We are using it from Python. Okay. In the nine tips that you spoke about, there was no selenium in it. Which one? In the nine tips which you spoke about, there was no selenium in it. Uh, where would you use Selenium? See, all this is done through Sel uh, our web driver Selenium only. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, using Selenium, we check the logs. Uh, we uh, So, some of these things we don't need Selenium. Uh, okay. Like HTML validation, we use a library called Request. Ah. So, we collect the content and then we send it to W3C API. Then uh, we look at the response. Hmm. But for all other test cases where we bring up the GUI and then uh, tear down the uh, browser. So before closing the browser, we look at the console logs. All this is done through Selenium. Yeah. In Selenium also, do you assert it? Yeah, assertion is uh, most important. Yes. Yeah, all test cases, uh, that, that is the one that uh, flags pass or fail. I, I have not used Selenium. Yeah. OK. So, Arvind, uh, something of non-UI, right? A bypass UI. Uh, can you repeat that question? I didn't catch it. 
Yeah, you mentioned the bypass GUI. Yeah. Do you mean that API testing? Yeah, you can say API testing. Although you know, uh, if you may want to make it more general, it is any endpoint testing. You may not have designed your uh, app based on APIs. It may be a monolith, but it doesn't matter whether it's a monolith or uh, designed using an API layer. Finally, your uh, application exposes uh, rest. Uh, I mean, endpoints to the clients. So you call those uh, endpoints directly by passing the GUI. Okay, and also uh, you said a uh, 450 GUI test. How much time it will take entire uh, 450 plus 150 CLI test? Yeah, that's uh, see this 150 CLI test. It takes only 15 minutes. It is very fast. Mm -hmm. But the 450 GUI test that takes a lot longer. It takes something like uh, five hours. But uh, if five hours if I do it sequentially. But what I do is I split those uh, 450 uh, test cases into four buckets. Let's say 110 test cases per bucket, something like that. And each one I run in a separate VM on uh, GitHub Actions. So I complete it in one hour something, one hour, 10 minutes. OK, and you so run all of taking, uh, Instead of uh, taking four hours or five hours, I do it in uh, one hour, 15 minutes by uh, running four VMs in parallel on GitHub Actions. OK, you have a, a suit of test cases. Yeah. Not suit. Uh, it's a very simple logic. I can show you that logic. Uh, basically, sure. by file name, I partition it. So, uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. My, uh, yeah. So you can see here. Uh, these are the test cases. Test about uh, test badges, browse articles, and so on. So what I do is all the A. I know roughly that all the test case files which start with A. They together add up to 120 test cases or something like that. So I just make these buckets based on the file names. So that I have a balanced set of four buckets and then I run them parallelly in four VMs. Okay, and you have that uh, GitHub actions, four actions return, right? No, it's a single action. It will split it. I can show you that code also. So, I don't know where it is. Yeah, here it is. It's a YAML file. Yeah, can you yeah. see this? Yeah. So you can see here, we create a matrix. Just look at this line of code. We create a matrix saying that GUI dot A, B to L, M to Z. That means uh, three partitions we are creating. Mm -hmm. So basically it will run in three VMs. I see. But okay. yeah, but uh, you know, uh, there are no three scripts as you put it. It is all single script, but at the entry to the script, we partition the test cases into these three buckets. But all three will run the same test case, okay. the same uh, script. Same thing is running in all three VMs, except that one VM will be looking only at these, another VM B to L, and the third VM will be M to Z. Okay, uh, this is something new to me. Okay, and uh, do you think that you know, yeah, because you use Python, the time is more. Even the fifteen minutes looks like high time. Mm, I don't know about that uh, because I have not used any other system. See, now there are. See, I started designing this uh, five years back. But uh, now they, we have other test uh, frameworks like Cypress, which is a JavaScript framework for test automation. 
Right. Then we have something from Microsoft called, I think, flashlight, if I'm not mistaken. So the I don't know how fast these are, and uh, so I, I can't uh, comment. But really, the yeah, the web uh, interaction with the GUI that is the uh, one that takes more time. The Python execution, I doubt very much whether that is the, the path of the bottleneck. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there are headless ways also. Yeah, when we do it on uh, see when I do it on my dev machine, I typically uh, don't do it headless. But when it's running in GitHub Actions, there it is headless. Okay. So I can show you that as well here. Let's see. Uh, I don't remember. Hold on. So you can see here when this GitHub Actions is launched. I pass this option to uh, PyTest, which is our test framework. So you notice that there is an option called headless. OK. Any other questions? So if not, let's go to the final bonus tip. In double quote. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> so testers, don't don't be discouraged. Heaven is waiting for you. So with that note, uh, I'll conclude the session. Uh, so do join uh, Devopedia. You can support us as a reader, writer, editor, donor. So anything you can write to us at webadmin at devopedia.org and uh, the site you have already seen.